upon Elijah and he ran ahead of the chariots of Ahab that during the course of this year the hand of God will become the reason for your speed will become the reason for your acceleration you've been on one spot for four years been on one spot for two years been on one spot for 12 years but in 2024 the hand of the Lord comes upon you it comes upon you comes upon you you will begin to gain mileage begin to gain acceleration things will begin to shift because the, of the hand of God 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 people waiting to see unfortunate things happen in your life so that they can gossip they will not have the opportunity because the hand of God the hand of God the hand of God will make you soar will give you mileage oh my God the hand of God the hand of God the hand of God is enabling me is empowering me is making a way where there seems to be none the hand of God the hand of God be our driving force only that which can defeat your hand will be able to defeat us we ride under the wind formed by your hand we gain mileage we gain acceleration be glorified in Jesus mighty name we pray amen once again you are welcome hallelujah 
Today, I need to train your eyes to be able to see altars in the passages of the New Testament. But before we do that, okay, that's supposed to be an introductory uh, initiative to bring us to church. All right, so let's go to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, as I try to bring us to church. Amen. Colossians, chapter 1, beginning from verse number 12. There is a reason for which Apostle Paul says we need to give thanks unto the Father. Giving thanks unto the Father, which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Hallelujah. He has made us qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13 who has delivered us from the power of darkness. Anytime you see the word delivered in the Bible, there was an altar that affected that transaction. Is that clear? I'm just trying to show you some vocabulary that are directly related to altars. They are direct effects of sacrifices of altars. The situation of humankind was a legal situation. The position of the justice system of heaven was revealed to Adam in the Garden of Eden concerning the implication of the fruit, fruits that he might decide to eat. In the day that you eat of this fruit, ye shall surely die. That's justice. That's justice. So if we are saying someone is delivered and the reason for which the person was brought into captivity is a judicial issue. It will take a judicial approach to secure the person's liberty. And that's why salvation is the greatest, the, the sacrifice of Jesus is the greatest legal statement that was ever made because it was able to secure our deliverance. There was an altar behind the enjoyment of deliverance. So anytime you read your Bible in the New Testament and you stumble on the word delivered, what are you dealing with? Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us. Are you there? You are not just delivered, but you are brought into a new ecosystem. The description of your life on the strength of these new terms can be factored in your habitat. And your new habitat is that you were translated into the kingdom of the son of his love. Anytime you see deliverance, you are dealing with an altar. Anytime you see translation, you are dealing with an altar. Yes? Next verse. In whom we have redemption. Anytime you see redemption, you are dealing with an altar. Redemption talks about a payment. The other day there was a theological argument as to who humankind was really indebted to for which payment was required. And some scholars in Oxford University came up with the fact that it was the devil that humanity was indebted to. Some other scholars, are you, are you following me? <laughs> you are not following me, so I will not continue with <laughs> are you, are you, Are you here? Yes, Some other scholars came up with arguments that it was God that humankind was indebted to. Because if you don't know who we were indebted to, it will be difficult for you to understand the story of redemption. Um, are you still with me? You know, I said something the other day, and Barista Kassar confirmed it, that the justice system of Nigeria, for instance, already has written in its creed the punishment that will come upon someone that breaks into somebody's house and takes away some of his goods. The, the judgment is already written. 
The judgment doesn't get written when the crime is committed. It, it was written before the crime. So God came to Adam and said to him, in the day that you eat on this, of this fruit, in dying ye shall surely die. That's the judgment that is written concerning that kind of trespass. So it was the laws of God that Adam trespassed. And that trespass was occasioned by a temptation that was facilitated by the enemy. The enemy was an enhancement to the trespass, but it was the laws of God that were violated. I don't know why. The Bible is so simple that you need to be complex, you need to be confused to miss the point. Meanwhile, in Oxford University, professors, they came with all kinds. Are you there? Anytime you deal with the word redemption, you are dealing with an altar. You will discover that redemption became a possibility through his blood. Anytime you are interacting with his blood, are you there? You are dealing with an altar. You see, later the cross, the entire New Testament philosophy is the place of altars. And we say that our own priesthood is predicated on the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And just in case, in, in, uh, in exercising the service of your altar, you need to pay a price, you need to fast, you need to pray. Are you there? Any price that you are paying is not a price compared to what Jesus paid. It is because Jesus paid a price that you are even going to be given the privilege to pay a price in order to use the currency that has been achieved by the sacrifice that Jesus put on the table to change things around your life. Your priesthood is based on the efficacy of his own priesthood. If Jesus had not died, even if you fast, it would not amount to anything. Exactly. So when you are dealing with redemption, you are dealing with an altar. When you are interacting with the blood, you are actually doing altar business. When you are dealing with forgiveness, you are dealing with an altar. The Bible says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Now, that is an attempt to open your eyes to biblical terminologies that would not have existed if Jesus had not paid the ultimate price. And that ultimate price that he paid is the biggest sacrifice that exists in the entire universe. And um, the basis upon which God considers things to be right is with reference to that big legal statement that was made on the cross. If you are still here, say amen. amen. Now, yesterday we were soaring in a teaching, and at some point, the Holy Ghost took over. I was not, uh, I'm not responsible for how the service ended. <laughs> yesterday in the name of Jesus Christ. So we were still looking at using the eyes and the, um, um, the lens of the Old Testament to understand the dealings that God has established within the courts of the new. And we said that the Old Testament is a shadow of things to come, of good things to come, a shadow of things to come, saying, meaning that the Old Testament is prophetic, and that the things that God wants to implement in the future, they are captured in shadows in the Old Testament. And I'm saying that if you have good eyes, you can actually see the New Testament hidden in the Old Testament. If you have good eyes, you will discover that it's actually the same thing. But if you don't know where to look, you will, you will dichotomize, and that is going to fragment the understanding of your theology. God is an object teacher. Before he comes to implement a policy, he will do something like a drama, something like a dress rehearsal. That dress rehearsal is prophetic and is pointing to the plan that God intends to implement. And if we, do not, if we did not have the privilege of looking upon the dress rehearsal, 
it will be totally impossible for us to understand, to apprehend a New Testament concepts and New Testament possibilities. So we were talking about the bond offering the other day. What? Well, peace offering. Peace offering. The Bible says, being justified by faith, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God. Our quarrel with God is sated. And because our quarrel with God is sated, we have peace with God through our justification. We've been declared righteous. And this great benefit that we have of God gives us the audacity to come into the presence of God without inferiority, without, without condemnation, so that we can approach God and do business with Him. We also established yesterday that one of the benefits and the structure of the New Testament, the structure of New Testament Christianity is built upon the possibility of access. Then we find the scripture that says, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I told us that the word liberty in that scripture is ancient English. The current rendering of the meaning of the use of that word would have been access. So in, in the New Testament, what God secures for us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is access to God. Now I'm going to tell you what, okay, are you there? That means it, what we do with that access to God is what is going to determine the outcome of our lives, what our lives will look like. That our access to God Taking advantage of that privilege that God has given us is all about the priesthood of the believer. What you use that access to do, you there? It's all about the priesthood of the believer. But you see that the access that we have to God is based on a sacrifice that was made. So the Bible says that we should come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. The Bible also says that we should come boldly by the blood. There's no access without an altar. You get that? If there is access, then we are saying we are talking altar. The reason why you can come before God without, without inferiority, you can come before God without uh, condemnation, is because there's an altar that has provided that opportunity. And that altar is an altar that is set up and the sacrifice that was put upon it is valued in measures of the blood of Jesus Christ. So everything in the environment of the New Testament is a priesthood that has been made available through bloody transactions. If you go to the book of Leviticus, you are going to see blood everywhere. Blood. And you would think that God is a butcher. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it's just showing us that everything about relating with God, interacting with God, receiving results from God, moving the hand of God is based on altars. Okay, now we will look at the last of the five offerings that Moses was directed to offer. He was the champion of priesthood in the old order, and he seemed to know how to appease God, how to move the hand of God, how to, so all of those technologies are captured in the book of Le Leviticus. But when you read that book, the meaning of that book is not what you are reading. The meaning of the book is what it is pointing to because the Old Testament is a shadow of good things to come. All right, so what we are trying to do is to find out what it is pointing to. The last offering among the five major offerings that God asked Moses to offer to him because God is the only one that knows what will satisfy him. So he gave Moses an insight into the kind of things that will satisfy him. And basically they are captured within the framework of these five major offerings. The last of them 
being the meal offering. Meal, M-E-A-L. The meal offering. The meal offering. Before I go into talking about the meal offering, I want to ask us the question, what, why do you eat food? Why do you eat food? Huh? To survive. Somebody said we eat food to survive. No. Um, there is a more primary motivation for eating food than survival. Survival is one of the results of it, eating food, but it's not the reason for which you eat food. The reason for which you eat, huh? <laughs> My God. I believe somebody believes I'm trying to twist, turn their head around. No, that's not the plan. Survival is not the reason for which you eat food. It's one of the results for eating food. But the reason why you eat food is to satisfy your hunger. It's your hunger that tells you that you need to do something. Are you there? If you have ever done, how many of you have done seven days dry fasting? When you are moving from the second to the third day, hunger, the sense of hunger will break. And then you just find yourself going on. Then it will now occur to you that the reason why you were compelled previously to eat food was because of a sense called hunger. And when you eat food, you eat to satisfy the hunger. When the hunger is satisfied, many other things result from your eating, like survival, just like many other things, nutrition. And so many good things happen. But what invited you to eating, the call to eat, was based on an appetite called hunger. Is that clear? The reason for which I had to do this very detailed explanation is because you, will not, you are not likely to understand the meal offering if you do not know that God is hungry. There is something that God is hungry for. Many times when we come into the presence of God, we bring our needs, we bring the things we want God to do, and then we are so selfish that we cannot sense that our God has a need. So what I do, are you there? Are you there? What I do is this. I try to be meeting God's need. I live my own. And I put myself in a position to be meeting God's need. And I discovered that when I began to meet God's need, God began to meet my need. So I want to show you a higher way to live. The meal offering. If you notice in my presentations, I don't take you into the study of the offerings from Old Testament perspective. It will just waste our time. Because after we finish that rigorous study, we need to connect it to the New Testament so that we can see this thing you just studied is a shadow. If all you go home with is this one we studied, you cannot apply it. So we need to move it this way so that you can see what that shadow was pointing to. So I'm not troubling you with the theology of the offering itself and the requirements and all of that. I'm just showing you the counterpart of that offering within the context of the New Testament because that's the one that has to do with you. So in the Old Testament, we see that we have creatures that were sacrificed. But in the New Testament, beginning from Jesus, Jesus was both the sacrifice and the offerer. So we moved into the living sacrifice context where you bear the sacrifice in human bodies. Exactly. How many of you fed around that three o'clock? That's when the hunger bites. Did you feel it today? It's your body that is feeling. <laughs> That's what it means, living sacrifice. You're going to be conscious of every commitment that you made make in this regard. It's not that you just take a goat there and they kill you. You don't even feel anything. You know, the goat has laid down. 
its life. But we, are, we operate the economy of the living sacrifice. So you are going to feel it. You will experience it. Hallelujah. But the good thing about it is that what you are, as you are experiencing it, it is translating to spiritual currency. Because spirits understand the dialect of what? Of sacrifice. Okay. We are dealing with the meal offering. And if I want to give you a summary, the purpose or the portrait of the meal offering is the prescription of a life that satisfies God. Just like I told you, you eat because there is hunger. And you may stop eating when your hunger is satisfied. God has a hunger. And he will be looking out generation after generation to find a life that has the capacity to satisfy his hunger. Now, let me give you a few background scriptures that will lead us into perfect understanding of the things that we are talking about. Now, can we start from the book of Isaiah chapter 66? Isaiah chapter 66, beginning from verse number one. Thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? Now, can we analyze that verse in a moment of time? God is looking for a house. God is looking for a place of rest. Meanwhile, he said that the heaven is his throne. He said that the earth is his footstool, but he's still looking for a house. It means that the heaven doesn't seem to satisfy this need that God seems to have. It means that the earth, as vast as it is, doesn't seem to be able to satisfy this need that God has. So God is still seeking, God is still reaching out, even though the place where his throne is pitched is in heaven, the place where his footstool is is on earth, but he still has a need. Do you realize that God's need has to do with something called rest? Huh? Oh, you're not following me. Okay. Now, so we, we need to mutilate our syllables because if you are not following, it means you need to labor in the wilderness for a season before God will educate you on the matters that are contained in this Bible study. So we are going to jump. Oh, online... Individuals. <laughs> Let's try one more time. He said, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you have built for me? And where is the place of my rest? So there is a rest that God is talking about. And I need to take us, digress a little, and talk about the theology of rest. This theology of rest that I'm trying to talk about, oh my, are you there? Yes. Stay with me. What we call, what was established as an ordinance called Sabbath in the physical, in the natural. You know, God, re he walked for how many days? For six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. Now, that Sabbath is to co commemorate a rest in the spirit. Not, it's not a natural thing. Because the person that has been walking for six days is a spirit being. All right? I know your perspective of rest is something that you catch up with when you are exhausted. That's how you understand rest. Uh, in the spirit world, it's not exactly as it applies to us in the natural. The whole idea of Sabbath is to establish the fact that even in the realm of the spirit, there is Rest. And I need to show you quickly in a few scriptures just to bring us up to speed. It will also interest you that it's only demon spirits that are not given a location for rest. Because the Bible says that when an unclean spirit is casted out of a man, he goes around in dry places seeking rest 
and findeth none. The reason why the unclean spirit considers his previous accommodation is because there is no allocation of rest for unclean spirit. Are you still there? Do you realize? Are you following? Do you realize that the rest that that unclean spirit is looking for is in his previous accommodation where he was cast out from? Think about it. When an unclean spirit is casted out of a man, he goes about in dry places seeking rest and findeth none. So it had rest when he possessed the man. So the rest of a spirit being is tied to his opportunity of possessing a vessel. So God's throne is in the heavens. God's footstool is on earth. But God is asking you, where is the house that you have built for me? And what? Where is the place of my rest? Are you there? Okay, so verse 2. For all these things have my hand made, and all, this, all those things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look. So the possibility of God's rest is tied to the heart of man. It's tied to man. On this man will I look. Not every kind of man, this type of man. I, I, there's a possibility of me finding rest with this type of man. Is that clear? Are you with me? So on this man will I look. What is the description of, of, of that man? Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. So if I find a man, I find a man that acknowledges his spiritual inadequacy, a man that acknowledges his insufficiency, a man that acknowledges that he was created as a limited being, I am going to find rest with him. A man that is of a contrite spirit, a man that is willing to submit himself to the authority of my word, I will find rest with him. So God's concept of rest is a bit different from our concept of rest. And that was why in the book of Matthew chapter number 3, we see something happening here in Matthew 3, verse 13 to 17. Matthew 3, verse 13 to 17. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have no need I have need to be baptized of thee, and comment thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. So we now have a testimony from God himself about Jesus. And when, 17, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well. Do you realize that that was the first time in the history of humankind that God found rest. That's the story of God's rest. God finds rest when there is a vessel that is poised to accomplish his will upon the face of the earth. God finds rest when there is a vessel that he can manipulate 
to bring his intentions to pass. In the history of God and in the history of humanity, the first time God is finding rest is with the man Jesus Christ. So when in the quadrant of the Godhead this policy was conceived, let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness, the object of that conception was a place where God could find rest. And Jesus was the first platform that God had in order for him to enjoy rest at that level. How many of you have read the book of John chapter 14 and you were confused at the terminologies that were used in that book? John chapter 14 is the scripture that says, Jesus was speaking and he says, in my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And for a long time, our interpretation of that scripture was that the mansions meant heaven. Mm. Well, it will interest you to know that that's John chapter 14, and the book of John has 21 chapters. So Jesus was not going to heaven in chapter 14. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to open your understanding. Are you there? I know you've, that's how you'll be. The evangelical, I'm not trying to dispossess that scripture from its traditional evangelical use. I'm just trying to explain it in context. If you take that scripture tomorrow and say, my father's house on a crusade ground, there are many mansions. I think we will try to assume that we understand what you're saying. But when we, we come from the crusade ground and we come in-house, where we have the opportunity to do exegesis of the Bible, then you might find that your position on the evangelical field very contrary to the actual intent that is carried in the scriptures. So the book of John it has 21 chapters, and Jesus wasn't planning to go to heaven in chapter 14. Jesus was planning to go to the cross in chapter 14. So your interpretation of uh, the mansions, meaning mansions in heaven, doesn't even fit the construct of where that scripture is in the belly of the book of John. Is that clear? Oh, you're not. The only audience I have now is online. So the online brethren, I'm here for you. So what Jesus meant when he says in my father's house was that he was his father's house. The, the word for mansions is meno in Greek language, which means dwellings. He was talking about the body of Christ, that if he goes to the cross, his body is going to be pierced, and you will become one with his body. You there? So he was talking of his body that his body has capacity to accommodate you. But he will need to go to the cross in order for that reality to come to pass so that where you are, where he is, you will be there also. He's talking about his body. You know why I had to bring this controversy up? Because in Jesus, God was able to find rest because it was his father's house. That, that desire of God, where is the house you have built for me, was fulfilled in John chapter 14. Jesus became his father's house. On this man will I look at? So for expression upon the face of the earth, there was only one man he was looking at. What's his name? Jesus. So if we go to the book of John, I'm going to show you how Jesus expressed his father. His preoccupation was to give expression to his father. He said, the words I'm speaking to you, they are not my words. They are the words of the one that is inside of me. So the father had the liberty of being expressed because Jesus was a theater uh, that he manifested his intentions. He found expression. So in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, you will hear... The Bible says, God, who has sundry times and in diverse manners speak unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, who is 
Okay. He has in this last day spoken unto us by his son, whom he, whom he has appointed help all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Verse 3 is my emphasis, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. That means the Father was manifested through his vessel in all brightness. Jesus did not obscure the manifestation of his Father. Jesus surrendered his will to the will of his Father so that his Father can be manifest through his vessel. In my Father's house, he said, there are many men. Today we are part of that body, that great organic, mystical body. We are part of it now. The reason why we are part of it is because of an altar, and the altar is the cross. So in Jesus, God found rest, and the hope that God has is that in you, he will find rest. So he can crawl into your own chamber in the body of Christ. He crawls into you. Are you there? And he finds as much rest as he would have found if he possessed only Jesus. That means he wants to find, he wants to find a heart that is contrite, a heart that is willing to receive his promptings, a heart that considers his words authoritative enough to be obeyed so that through your vessel, he can find expression. That kind of life that is sold out to God, that is willing to please God, willing to express God, is a life that satisfies God. Let me show you the chatter, the maze of the eternal purpose. This is captured in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Maybe it will give you an idea of what we are talking about. This lifestyle is a lifestyle of priesthood. If you want to knock on God's door and God will answer, your life must be a living sacrifice such as is pleasing unto God. Your life must be meeting the need that is upon God's hand, which is the need for rest. That in you, God is the one that has been expressed. His will is the policy that has been implemented through your uprising and your down sitting. If you live such a life and you come to heaven's door and you knock, when you ask, you will receive. When you seek, you will find. And when you knock, it shall be opened unto you. So before we talk about asking and methods of asking and all of those dynamics that are associated with it, I need to make it clear to you that there is a kind of man that God answers. He will answer the man that is like Jesus. You will notice Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus when the stone was rolled away. I hope you still remember what he said. Father, what? I thank you because you always hear me. Now, don't be quick to say it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a declaration of faith. Don't be quick. Because I know you want to make that conclusion. And say, so he just came and he's speaking by faith. Karabo sataya. And I'm telling you that there is a lifestyle. <laughs> there is a lifestyle that Jesus lived. And that lifestyle is a lifestyle of answers. That lifestyle guarantees answers because it is satisfying the need that is on the heart of God. Now let me show you the maze of the eternal purpose. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, when I'm done, then I will define. I'll give you many definitions of what an altar is. And there are so many of them. It is after these definitions, next week we'll now begin to look into the technology of setting up a personal altar. Now that you understand that the language and the dialect of spirit is sacrifice, then it will be very easy for you to comprehend the protocol. Each and every one of us seated here has the potential to be able to move the hand of God and to do great things upon the face of the earth in line with God's policy direction for your life. The extent of your powers will be dependent on God's will for you. If there's someone here who has a destiny in the area of leadership, 
God's major miracles will be effected on the campaign grounds. Are you there? Consistent with the purpose that God has called you to fulfill, that's what will determine how many miracles and the shape of miracles that you experience on the field. God will go out of his ways to confirm that he has installed you in that capacity. And men that are not likely to favor you, that need to stand with you in order for the purposes of God to come to pass, they will go out of their ways to be a blessing to you. And the sons of strangers will stand and build your walls. Now, the definition and the description of miracles is consistent in its diversity to the calling and the purpose that God has called you to, to accomplish. Is that clear? All right, so I need to show you something quickly in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. You must be cerebrally focused in order for you to make meaning out of the book of Ephesians. That's the book for which he prayed. Apostle Paul prayed for 17 years, asking that God will give him utterance to be able to communicate the mysteries that were captured in the encounters he received from God. He found this utterance in the book of Ephesians. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. Okay, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Stop there. I think this is where I need to start explaining from. Because it's becoming complicated. He said we should bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason why he's asking us to bless him is because before he's requesting that we should bless him, God has blessed us. He has already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms in Christ. How many of you have ever visited Central Bank of Nigeria? Central Bank. You have had business with Central Bank. Now, so this scripture is Central Bank. This is Central Bank. Central Bank of the Spirit realm. This scripture reveals to us a store of spiritual value, a pool of spiritual fund that is expected to fund your calling, to fund your purpose, to fund your destiny, to fund the purpose of God upon your life. Because many of us think that you are an accident. You just manifested. You just showed up. God is saying, our Father made a location for us. And he blessed us in all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Two things wrong with this account system, this bank account. Two things wrong. The first thing that is wrong with it is that the account is in heaven. And me, I am in Makode. And the price of fuel in Makode is how much? Huh? Okay, if that one too is difficult for you to say, then it means that we are, we are far away from change. I say... You don't know again, so, you know, where well, you are just there. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, they don't know the price of wealth here. God is hearing. The bank account is in heaven. The challenge is on earth. Why would God create such a, a problem? That's the first challenge with the, with, the, with the resources. It's in heaven. Second challenge with the resources is that the bank account is in the name of Jesus. <laughs> if God really wanted to give us money. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. The resources are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Domiciled in Christ Jesus. 
So if God really wanted to make resources available to us, how will he complicate our accounting system like this? He puts it in heaven and then puts it in the name of Jesus. Uh, I need to tell you that there was once upon a time when God put that account in the name of a man called Adam. And Adam had dealings with Satan and transferred all the resources <laughs> to, to, to the kingdom of darkness. And that's why Satan has so much resources to attack you and to attack me. In fact, he has a query site and a laboratory where he forms weapons against, that are specific to individuals. And that's why the Bible says no weapon that is formed. That is not general weapon. It's formed against you. It has your measurement in it. It has your longitude and your latitude. It's built into the weapons. Where did Satan get the resources to be making idiosyncratic weapons that are particular to you? Adam wield all the resources in the account to Satan. It is after that happened that now he traps all the resources in the name of Jesus. Is that clear? I'm trying to show you the maze of the eternal purpose. The first thing that God shows us in the revelation of the eternal purpose are the resources that he has made available to equip you to fulfill your destiny. Do you realize that prosperity, in my own view, don't quote me, I've been studying that Bible. It's not a message. Prosperity is not a message. It's the result of alignment. It's a consequence of something deeper. Seek it first, for instance, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all other things shall be added. So the real preoccupation is to get focused with kingdom business. That assignment that God has given to you to accomplish as captured in the kingdom of God is, is a primary endeavor that will compel resources to navigate in your direction. Is that clear? Don't ever think that all the resources that you are seeing, even the ones people testify about and give testimony, don't think is divine prosperity. Especially if we cannot confirm that the person has an orientation, a focus on kingdom things, on kingdom matters. If there is this uncompromising devotion to accomplish God's will upon the face of the earth, your own wealth has an errand attached to it already. Then we'll know, yeah, this is divine prosperity. And in all cases, it's a consequence of alignment. So instead of me to tell you how to sell shares as a means of equipping you with knowledge, meanwhile, there are people who have that dimension of calling. Are you there? I think uh, Pastor Tony has plans on how to bring uh, people here that will give you skill acquisition and all that. He has plans for that. Are you there? But you can have, I've met somebody before, he read all the right courses and he read them in the right schools. I'm talking of foreign schools and he got first class from all those places and as at the time, and uh, a master's degree to back it up. As at the time we were interacting, he was still jobless. May, may, the, Lord help. <laughs> may the Lord help us in the name of Jesus. So, so Tony will bring uh, the skill acquisition and all those dimensions. But me, I will bring doctrine first. Are you there? And because the more I studied the Bible, the more I discovered that God made provision for all of us. So it may just seem that there's an issue of alignment. Do you realize that it's this year that God now told me, no, 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 it's, this year just started. Somewhere around last year, it became clear to me how God intended for me to make money. There is a way, but God will not reveal it to you until he's sure where your heart is. Because if you make more money than this, some of you, I know where, I know. I know, you is Belgium, you will be in Belgium. <laughs> and I'm not saying that those people whose destiny is in Belgium, I'm not saying 
you will find it difficult to get there. You will get there in the name of Jesus Christ. But let no one who has no business with Belgium ever get there. Let him stay where God has assigned him. That is what will qualify you to be able to withdraw from that account. So first of all, the account is in heaven. It's in the name of Jesus. So I told you why it is in the name of Jesus, because it was in the name of Adam previously. And you know, Adam had handling issues. Before, when we woke up, we were, we were broke. <laughs> we were totally broke. And the symptoms of our being broke in some quarters is still very vibrant. But we are in a new place now. We are in Christ Jesus. And in Christ Jesus, there's provision, there's allocation. There was a plan, there was a program, there was a budget. And it is a budget that we are seeing that the budget pre, pre existed us. It existed before we even showed up in the plains of Christ. Okay? Are you there? Um, somebody's still complaining and said the bank account is, is in heaven. It's in heaven. Why is it not in First Bank? It should have been domiciled in First Bank, domiciled in Access Bank, so that uh, when we go there, we just say, you know, five million for evangelism in the north, and then um, divert it. <laughs> so it is not in First Bank, it's not domiciled in Access Bank, it is in heaven. So I need to show you the things that you need to do in order for you to withdraw from it. One of, one of it, in fact, you will need to open a sub-account. A sub-account where your own line of credit will be raised and domiciled. The purpose of this lecture is not prosperity talk for now, but I'm just showing you your account. Are you there? But you have seen one scripture that says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added unto you. Sometimes God might even tell you, Follow this man, follow this man. And when he gives you that instruction, you may not know that the resources you will enjoy in your life is in that followership. Every one of us doesn't need to be a pioneer. And I can tell you, I did not desire to pioneer a ministry. It, it came on me. It fell on me. And um, please don't be a pioneer because you will not sleep. Why? Do, <laughs> oh, Jesus. If it's not a calling that God has given you, don't aspire for it. It's easier to follow people that are accurate. You will, you will fight less. You rest more. And life will be wonderful for you. Are you there? Say, follow this man. And that instruction captures your prosperity, your well-being, captures everything. And as long as you refuse to follow him, you will walk in dry places, and no form of intercession will help you. Now, there were some young men that decided they knew God's will, and they felt it was difficult. They decided to violate it with the hope that since they know how to pray, they will move the hand of God. It's been seven years, and they have been walking in dry places. Dry. Your life will not be dry. You will be humble enough, contrite enough. You will tremble so much at God's word that if he gives you direction, you will follow like a fool. And then you'll begin to see how God will begin to prosper you. Don't joke with divine direction. Because in it are secrets on how you will prosper on earth. Okay, did you get that? All right, so next verse. Next verse. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. This is a complex scripture. What makes it complex is that the first thing that we see in that scripture is that God decided, on your case, on my case, he decided to exercise his authority. Anytime you see the word choose, it means God exercised his authority for choice, his right to choice. And when we say choice, we are talking about choosing among various alternatives. Are you the only person in your family? But he chose you. There were many other people there. But he decided to smuggle salvation into your spirit. Now you are enlightened. There are many things that they do in that family that you cannot join them to do because you were chosen. 
You see, so the Bible says that God, by an act of his authority, decided to choose you in him before the foundations of the world. Now, stay with me. I know that when you look at that scripture, you see the foundation of the world, it already makes, unbalances you. Stay with me. You see, there is a place where you were chosen. You were chosen in Christ. And until you are brought into Christ, it will not be obvious to you that you were chosen. The mystery behind your choice is in Christ. It is when you are brought into Christ through salvation and you begin to walk with God, you will now discover there's no mistake in that ecosystem. Let me give you an idea. Uh, some of you were here yesterday when we brought the brokio. After we distributed the brokio, we, we did not even keep one copy. I don't know where Pastor Dan got what he got. But we now looked at it and discovered that even though we're not looking at the brokio, we're keeping step with God, we fulfilled everything that was in the brokio. That means the results we had, the prayers that were answered, the things that opened up, they were not by chance. Even though the script was not there for us to look, we were following that script. And the time that God spoke to me about online ministry was when we were doing Cyber Cafe. How many of you remember the days of Cyber Cafe? Oh, no. That was when God spoke about online ministry. And I must tell you the truth, I did not know what online ministry was. But it was what I heard that I wrote. Years later, even as I'm preaching now, it is online. There are people in the U.S., people in the U.K., people in Europe, people in South Africa, people in Botswana, people in Ghana. In fact, our branches are watching. We are online. But by the time God spoke it, it did not make sense. But we just wrote it in his primit, at the way it came, raw, like that. And then we misplaced it. And we are leaving that which was written. So you will know that it's not an accident. It is only in Christ that you will know that there was a plan for you before you showed up. Because he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And the reason why he chose us was with a hope that when you come into time, you will be holy. That means you will separate yourself to him to serve his will. You will not come here and manufacture your own program and begin to run your program. He chose you with a hope that when you show up here, you will align with him You'll be separated unto him so that he can use you to accomplish what he has in mind. Are you following me? I'm trying to show you a life, a life that will satisfy its hunger. How many of you still remember John chapter 1 verse 3, 2? There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came. Verse 6, okay. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Yes, next verse. They same came for a witness. Stop. They sent him from the studio. And when he came into time, he was the same man that they sent from the studio. The same. But some of you, they sent you from the studio to be an evangelist. They are still looking for the evangelist in time because he has, a, he has eloped. <laughs> he came here and became something else. But John, when John came, the same the way he was captured in the studio, that was how he manifested in time. They sent a prophet from the studio. He's a blogger in time. They are, they are, they are looking everywhere. Where is this guy that we dispatch now? Because the moment he hit the ground, he became another creature entirely. So the reason why he chose you was an act of faith. That when you come into time, you will choose him and you will separate yourself to him so that he can fulfill his mandate through your life. Have I taken to all the time? Tony, am I still? Okay, okay, I have 30 minutes. That's why he chose you. So that when you come into time, you will separate yourself unto him so that he can fulfill what he wants to do through your life with your life. I've never told you people this story before, but I need to tell you. 
I was a footballer. Are you, are you aware of that? <laughs> you, are not, you, are not aware, you are not aware of it. I was number 10. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. You need to see me. No, there's no skill left now. But, oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord. And one day, I don't know what encounter my other sister had. I was coming from the field. We won. My sister, elder sister, now started crying at the door of our house that this is not what God called you to do. He broke my heart. And that's how my football career died. Because I came from the studio, an apostle, but when I was missing. <laughs> When they look for you from the studio, they will find you in the name of Jesus Christ. The same came for a witness. It was the same way he was in the studio. When he came into time, he was what? The same. So God chose you in him with the hope that when you come into time, you will separate yourself to him and allow him to manifest his program through your life. Are you there? And the only reason why you will manifest that way, separate before him, and become blameless before him, is that you get to love him. The true motivation for holy living is love. Imagine. If you marry a wife and you love your wife, and the love is deep, the way my homage is with me. Are you, are you there? <laughs> the love is deep. Some of us are not emotional men. I, you must have known that. We, we, are, we are not, no, our, but that woman, ah, is deep. So one of the reasons why I will not cheat on her is because of that deep. So if you have something with God in the depths of love, you will not want to violate it. That's the secret of holy living. It's not, it's not, it's not a dream to be pious, sanctimonious, and sacramental. It is love in expression. I have something with God and and the love of God will constrain you. So what God does is that he invests his love in your life lavishly. And when he does that, when you are in a situation that affords you the opportunity to deny him because of what you have with him, you will not be able to put your heart to denying him. That's when you really become a slave of God, when you have touched his love. Then even if he says, pack your bags, you are going to the war front. Because of what you have with him, you already know that he cannot be against you. Are you there? So you are pliable in his hands because there's a soft spot that has been secure. He said that the possibility of living holy and blameless before him is going to be occasioned by what? By love. This scripture is trying to reveal to us a prescription of life that God is looking for in your life, in my life, that will satisfy him. Next verse. The reason why he's hoping that you will be holy without blame before him in love is because he has predestinated you and adopted you as a child through Jesus Christ to himself. So one of the things that, are you there? Are you there? In the eternal purpose, one of the golden desires of God is that God wanted children. So he used Jesus Christ to adopt us to become his children because he wanted many children. So 
In, because he wanted many children, he took his only son and sowed him as a seed. When that son germinated in resurrection, he germinated with all of us. And many more that will give their life to Christ. And our children that will come and serve him in the days to come. Are you, do you understand what I'm talking about? God wanted children. And in order for him to fulfill his desire, he gave out his own child. God himself believed in the law of sowing and reaping. And that was what he, he submitted himself to the principles that he himself established. That's the kind of faith our God has. And that's why God doesn't use words the way we do, because when God speaks, his words become law, and he himself becomes subject to it. The Bible saying he wanted children. Children that would be separated unto him and would be blameless before him, just like his son Jesus Christ that he gave us a seed. And this whole arrangement is according to the good pleasure of his will. This is where I'm going. This showed us the original reason for which God even created in the first place. The reason and the motivation for creation is that God had a desire, a desire in his heart. And we are beginning to see the elements of the desire. One of the desires is that he wanted children. And he did not just want children that are anyhow children, but children that are conformed, that are like his son, Jesus Christ. That even though Jesus Christ had a will of his own, he always surrendered his will in order to serve the will of the Father. Not rebellious children, but children that will surrender their will to his will so that he will rest with them. He can have expression with them. He can depend on them for expression. He can depend on them for manifestation. He can depend on them to fulfill his will upon the face of the earth because his will will become their will because their will will be surrendered to take up his will. You get that? He had this desire from eternity past before this foundation of the world. And that is the reason for which he was motivated to create. If we go to the book of Revelation, you are going to see that all things were made for his pleasure. For his pleasure. So you, you notice that that was the original motivation behind creation. And he's hoping that that pleasure, that hunger, will be satisfied. And the only way that hunger can be satisfied is when me, I decide to separate myself unto him so that he can fulfill what he has in mind through me. In that way, my life will be meeting a need that is upon the heart of God. And that need that is upon the heart of God was a need that God sensed in eternity past before he embarked on the enterprise of creation. So now I have come to do thy will, O God. That's the meal offering that will make God satisfied. When you live that way and you come to God and you ask, you will receive. When you live that way and you come to God and you seek, you will find. When you live that way, when you knock, it will be open. Now, most of you don't believe me. Tomorrow I'll start defining altar with various scriptures. The concept of altars, it runs through the entire Bible. So we'll try to get all of the definitions of altar and its applications in the entire Bible. But I want to prove a point. Is it possible? So I have 20 minutes to go. I want to show you to a little extent, a little extent, not 100%, a little extent, I am living the life, this life that I preach to you about. Hallelujah. Not 100% the way God wants me to live it. I'm still in a work in progress. But I'm not living for myself. I'm living for Jesus. All right? And I'm not living to protect myself. Just in case my death will serve his will. So let me show you how easy it is for me to go into heaven this night. So that you know that prayer. Yes, prayer is in the Bible. Pr ask. And you shall receive. <laughs> Seek. 
and he shall find. Knock, and it shall be open. There are many, 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 many things that precede that possibility. One of which is that your life, if you want to get for best results, your life must be in sync with his pleasure. So this is the life I live. So now, we want to see how that life gives us access to the presence of God. Can we speak in tongues for five minutes? So falama hadeni. Broske so sale ken de hele berekos ki so sika baminaite. Guva veli abres kofedi eko bama. Eko salimondele. Iko pres kufa tezika brae kambola mala. I so breke sa sa kuria bahalaita. Mombre heskito kiko babina silia embra bobos asasa inko presko filama laikante ule mele keski so sabraska toma alibako yaiko pris yellow bondo iko bramali kasala bonda bahasi kopre Escoprante kuje ala kuria prebina hante koskete yela brunda haske kura igo baba baila jo prekesko temine la iko prela. Koso molo ige lebrus kabanda akai kombesko iko prela. Iska belimando, belimekeria, melibasiko, brasketa, mande kuria, ebokonde heze kalato kusketa briga baminaile, elonde ele karika sekula, mahambrela, isasale, ikobres, kombi la kuria, balako sketo menda, higo balamo kuria, breskite, mande kakunda, hika meza, liko braminaila, Isko boro konde, isko bera malabaya, isko bresko sasiko brante, isko bela kunda, ayango bose, isko boro kotala, isko sezi, isko mandelia, isko bregadanta koze kampalure kabadahase, rakabonda, isa maita, akabesko tamina, iko branta baboke eske, ramaneni nomokuri abrisko tamina kandeli, aika, aika mela, Ai kaskobilando iso sege e klabrokos kamalaita kunde mahisko baba bantelia eskabai kompatwa isko brakateli aseminando iko bresko palo kanemanda kosa. Thank you, Father. There is somebody in our midst, you have this pain on your left leg. It is three years old. Three years old. If you are here, stand on your feet. You have a pain on your left leg. It is three years old. Now, some people are standing because they are praying in the spirit. But the person I'm talking about, if it is you, come, come here. Come. There's a pain on your leg. You've been having this pain for three years. Three years. There is a life that you live. When you begin to knock, you will find. So we taught priesthood previously. We taught priesthood previously without concentrating on the life of the priest. And the crown of glory, which is the last piece of the attire of a priest. Written on it in very bold writing is holiness unto the Lord. If we can teach people how to walk in holiness, they will have all of their prayers answered. All of their prayers. 
all of what I'm telling you is something I've experienced in a measure so much so that I don't pray for money anymore there are many prayer points that have been taken off my list because those ones I have a personal covenant from God on those issues and I will show you the way the pathway to personal covenants with God I don't pray for money I don't pray for resources we have major projects running to hundreds of millions this year by the time we get to December, it will have been accomplished. Before we call you a prophet, we must be sure of your life of holiness. And you must have modeled it before people. There's evidence that this one is separated unto God. The, the, what makes him catch fun is that he's one with God. He's on God's side. Do you understand that? When you live that way, you can walk into the realm of the spirit and out as you please. Walk in and out. I was telling my elder brother here yesterday that my life is beginning to confuse me. Because I'm noticing now that I'm becoming more of a prophet than what I used to be before. It's not something I'm, new, I'm used to in that sense but before I, I wake up in the morning it will download people that I will meet something <sighs> let's confirm this so that it not look as if we are making it up before I pray I choose the way of the And for the way of the Lord is the way of wisdom. I choose the way of the Lord. Oh, she my aunt. For the way of the Lord. For the way of the Lord is the way of wisdom. I choose the way of the Lord. Now, I want us to close. That's why I, don't, I will not enter. But where we got to, I was able to see the angel alight on this lady here. Yeah? Yes, I alighted on you. And then when he became bright, he now spoke to me. He said, that which is lost has been found. That, that's what I should tell you. That which is, there's something lost, but that which is lost, it has been found. Mm. Of the Lord is the way of peace. Oh, choose the way of the Lord. I know most of you cannot see it, but there's an angel here carrying a jar of oil. All oh, the way of the Lord. Is the way of peace. I choose the way of the Lord. Woo! I know some of you don't believe when I say I saw an angel. He Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Pastor. So, Daddy, you gave um, the word of knowledge. Five of them were, were implicated by that word of knowledge. 
on the left leg. Can they confirm that it's three years? Yes, all confirmed, three years. Okay. Just one of them that has his own on the right leg. One of them has it on the right? Yes, sir. All right. You know, if it is true that God is speaking, you can, you can ask him. So what we'll do, we'll just touch like this. Who among you here is, is owing money? The other one? Uh, B, bring him to the office at the end of the service, huh? I'm seeing. Let me just bless you. Let me bless you. Can we pray in tongues for one minute? Just one minute. <laughs> Lord, take away this affliction. Take away this pain. the hand of God is coming stronger on these people that I touched. It's coming stronger. There's one of you I'm looking for. The power of God will re reveal that person. Power of God. Now listen, there's somebody in the congregation, a spiritual arrow was shot at you. A spiritual arrow was shot at you. You are in the congregation. Now what the Lord will do, the hand of God will become strong on you so that we need to remove it before I sit down. Father, in the name of Jesus, that one that is carrying this arrow, the one in the congregation that is carrying this arrow, can you show us mercy? And release your hand to come heavy upon that individual so that the person can be delivered. Stretch forth your hand. Let it come heavy. Let it come heavy upon this individual let it come heavy let it come heavy now ushers help me let's just do that deliverance just that deliverance Eesh. Mm. he got the heart say. he got the heart satellite Somebody in the congregation, part of the reasons why you have experienced ill luck in your relationships because of what I see now. Ushers, let's do that deliverance quickly. I see a creature like a serpent following you everywhere you go, and this creature is responsible for upturning your relationship life. For upturning your relationship life. In the next 17 seconds, something like fire is going to engulf you. Something like fire will engulf you. It will engulf you. To engulf you. And this serpent will be arrested. 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 It will be arrested. It will be arrested. Lady, let's cast out that. Oh, Jesus.
The spirit of death is upon someone here. Away of the Lord. Spirit of death is upon somebody here. They, something like heat will come upon you. Something like heat will come upon that person that the spirit of death is upon. Heat. Heat will come upon you. 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 Holy Ghost! All the way of the Lord is the way of His Lord. I choose the way of the Lord. Let her go in the name of Jesus. Let's remove that death from that lady. Leave her. Leave her. Leave her. Leave her. Hey. There's a glory. There's a glory that just came. Can you decree that no member of your family will be lost to death? If you say it, it will come to pass because there's glory. There's glory here. There's glory. There's glory. No one. No one will be taken. No one will be snatched. Come on, see me, Alaba. Come on, oh, see, come on, my my heart. Korea, my Santa, baboni, bakaski. 